What's up, family? Pastor Darius here. Listen, I want you to I want you to hear my heart with this with this message because I need you sitting down and taking notes for this with this message. I'm telling you. Um, some of the greatest missteps people have made, they blamed it on the master. Some of their greatest failure, they blamed it on the father. God told me. And I don't think we'll ever get hearing God's voice right perfectly. I think we have imperfect ears, but we can be perfected. We can get better at it. And in this series, I'm going to the Bible and showing you three ways in Acts chapter number eight that God speaks to or leads us. Because if we don't know the ways he leads us, we won't know where to actually look for his leadership. And so this message is called Jesus Take the Wheel. And here's what I want you to do. If it adds any value to you, I just want you to share it with somebody else. Right, take care. God bless. Let's go to the word of God. I, I want to look at the book of Acts chapter number 8, verse number 26, um, beginning at verse number 30. I mean, beginning at verse number 26, going to verse number 31. Uh, it says this, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candate, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked, how can I? Philip asked, and the man said, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. I want to stop the reading of scripture there and talk from this subject in our time together, family. Jesus, take the wheel. Amen. Clap your hands, 1130, if you're ready for God's word. Family, I want to leap into this lesson by introducing an axiom that I think may not be extremely impressive, but I do believe it's extremely important. And I want to know at the 1130 service, do you want to know what this axiom is? Okay, here it is for my note takers. If I want God to protect me, I must be willing to let him direct me. Let's say it one more time for note takers. If I want God to protect me, I must be willing to let him direct me because his protection is tied up in his direction. And many of this can relate to this. Many of us can relate to this reality because we've experienced this in human relationships. There are people who won't take your advice on the front end, but then will ask for your help on the back end. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> they, 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 they ask for your protection because they didn't take your direction. You can't protect who you can't direct. You can't insulate someone from adversity that keeps ignoring your advice. You can't look out for people long term who refuse to listen to you. And if people keep ignoring your direction, then they're jeopardizing their protection protection because direction often provides protection. I need somebody to say yes. And this is why God has a deep desire to do more than just save our life. God actually wants to lead our life. He wants to lead our life not because it's in his best interest. He wants to lead our life because it's in our best interest. He wants to lead it because he knows what we don't know. He sees what we don't see. He can predict what we cannot predict. He knows if we lead it, we'll end up someplace. But if he leads it, we'll end up at the right place. David captures this beautifully in Psalms 23 when David says these words, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Come on church. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over let your pastor be baptist for just this one word surely surely 
not maybe, not possibly, but surely goodness and mercy will follow me. In other words, David says, if I follow him, I don't have to follow it. It will follow me. If I chase him, I don't have to chase it because it will chase me. And I want to know, am I talking to anybody at the 1130 that's got a revelation in this season of what to chase? You've chased the wrong thing long enough to know what's worth chasing now and what's worth leaving. But the Bible is very clear. If I seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, all these things shall be added unto me. Is there anybody that's believing for goodness and mercy to chase you down? I want blessing to stalk me. I want it to be waiting on me when I come out of the grocery store, when I come out of the mall, when I pull up in my neighborhood. I want it chasing me down. Come on, listen, listen to what David says. He, he, he says, he says, he says, all of these things can be my experience if the Lord is my shepherd. Did you hear what I just said? Come on, come on. Verse 2 says, he makes me to lie down. That's David saying he knows how to force the right pit stops. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, he, 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 makes, he says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He lets me go not to but through the valley of the shadow of death without fear of evil because he's with me. He says his rod, which was a stick that was used to ward off beasts and animals and enemies. He says, and your staff protect me, comfort me. Not just the rod, but the staff. The rod is a straight stick. The staff was a stick with a hook on the end of it. So the rod was for the enemy. The staff was for me. So when sheep started straying away from the flock, the shepherd would use the staff and hook the sheep around the neck and pull that sheep back in. And somebody ought to celebrate right there because there are times where we strayed away. There were times where we stepped out of bounds. And when you didn't have enough spiritual sense to come back to God, God knew how to hook you and bring you back in. Come on here. Is there anybody here that can testify there were seasons where God let you be with them, but he wouldn't let you be like them? He says, I know you with them while they doing it, but when you try to do it, I'm going to reel you back in because I put something different on you. I've anointed you. I've called you. I've marked you. I've chosen you, and they can get away with it and sleep at night. If you do it, I'm going to keep you up all night because I got something different on your life. Come here. You've been called. But all of that is predicated on verse 1. He can't lead me to green pastures. He can't restore my soul if I won't let him be my shepherd. Notice what David said. He didn't say the Lord is a shepherd. He's my shepherd. See, see, just because he is a shepherd doesn't mean I've made a decision to make him my shepherd. Because to make him my shepherd means I got to be willing to give up something we want to keep. And it's weird because we need to give up something that we want to keep that we think we have that we really don't. So we're holding on to something because we think we have it and because we think we have it, it gives us peace. Because we think having this keeps us in a position. Are y'all following me? Yeah, we, we, we think having this is actually keeping us when the truth of the matter is you have peace about an illusion of possessing something you really don't possess. And God's like, I need you to give this to me because you think you got it, but you don't. So you're feeling secure about something you think you have that you really don't have. And because you have the illusion of it, you think you got the substance of it. And I need you to give that to me so I can be your shepherd. And that is the illusion of control. And some people say, I like to be in control, but you're not. 
You have influence, but you don't have control. You have influence, but you don't. You can contribute to an outcome, but you can't determine an outcome. You're not in control because you're not sovereign. You don't have the final say. You can control whether or not you fill out the application correctly. You cannot control whether or not the person that's making a decision regarding your application looks at it objectively. Y'all aren't talking to me. You can control if you stay on your side of the road. You can't control if somebody else stays on their side of the road. You can control how you say it, when you say it, if you pray before you say it. But you cannot control their past and their traumas and their filter and their interpretive lens that determines how you how they receive what you have to say. You don't have control. So God's like, go ahead and give me what you don't have that you think you have so I can give you what you really need. You think you've been in control. I've been in control. You think you're alive because you're in control. That was me. I was blocking stuff and blessing you in ways you didn't even know about. You've been praising me for what you know about. You ought to be praising me for what you don't know about. The stuff I stopped from even getting to you. The doors I closed. The times I suffocated the activity of the enemy. We want the Savior, but we need the Shepherd. I need to give control instead of me leading and asking him to bless what I'm doing. I need to ask him what he doing because that's already blessed. Everybody all right? I feel like we need a little therapy right now because you're like, I don't have control. I thought I... (laughs) And I want you to know he wants to be our shepherd. He is anxious to be our shepherd. He is, he is anticipating an opportunity to be our shepherd. We need him to be our shepherd. But it is one thing to know that we need him to lead us. It is another thing to know how he wants to do it. Because if I don't know biblically how he wants to do it, I won't know where to look for his leadership. So I'll be looking for his leadership in all the wrong places. And I'm taking a day like today and I'm standing flat footed and teaching this because as a pastor, what I've seen in almost two decades of pastoral ministry is many people's missteps are missteps they blame on the master. Many of their failures are failures they blame on the father. And it is not that they're not trying to follow him. They are trying to follow him because they've been taught to follow, but they hadn't been taught how. So they're operating with the sin of presumption and assumption and assuming that I understand the ways he wants me to lead. But the text here in Acts chapter number eight reveals to us not just that the Holy Spirit wants to lead, but how he leads us. Can I show it to you? I say, can I show it to you? Who wants me to show it to you? All right. Here it is. Here it is. This is interesting. The, 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 book, the book of Acts here. The book of Acts is, is called Acts because it's the Acts of the Apostles. It is the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. This book is real interesting. It's interesting because it's written by a man named Luke. The Gospel writer Luke. It's written by Luke. And Luke is the in- interesting writer for this book because Luke's not a historian. Luke's a physician. Y'all missed that already? I said Luke is not a historian, family. Luke is a physician. And it's interesting. He's not a theologian, but God used a physician to write the gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts because God will use what you think is irrelevant because you can't be a good physician without being good with details without being thorough without being investigative without being patient without being meticulous and could it be that God used this aspect of Luke's existence to be an asset for the kingdom his detailed nature and meticulousness is revealed in the pages of this book pastor what does Luke have to do with me it's got a lot to do with you and me because there may have been some seasons where we were enrolled 
goals that didn't make sense to us where we got degrees that we are not using and they seem irrelevant to us but God who is a good steward wastes nothing and he will use everything and take what you think is an irrelevant irritant and make it an asset I want to tell you that there may have been some bad seasons some complex seasons some confusing seasons but there are no wasted seasons God will redeem what you feel like is irrelevant I'm not using the degree but you're using what the degree taught you you're using the character trait of resilience that the degree taught you am I making sense here listen to this family listen to this Luke writes here and in Acts chapter 8 he exposes us to an incident involving a gentleman named Philip and his exchange with this Ethiopian eunuch and I want you to catch what happens here Philip has just finished ministry in Samaria and God leads him to go down from Jerusalem says go south and go towards Gaza I want you to see what happens the spirit God leads him he follows and as he's following God's leadership his paths cross with this Ethiopian man who's a civil leader overseeing the treasury of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. Okay, 1130, let me say it again. God tells, leads Philip to go from Jerusalem down to Gaza. Say, go this way. And Philip has no explanation, but he obeys without an explanation. And as he's, as he's obeying without an explanation, his paths cross with this man from Ethiopia who had come to worship in Jerusalem. Okay. So God leads Philip to go this way. He gives him instruction without explanation. And many of us would have missed this moment because our obedience is contingent upon an explanation. Yeah, the time he spent walking, we still would have been waiting on a why. Lord, now why this, now why? So Philip just starts walking. And as he's walking, he bumps into the reason God put him on that path. So the explanation comes through an experience. You missed what I just said. The only, re only way Philip was able to find out why God sent him in that direction was to keep walking long enough for God to give him an experience and the experience was the explanation because sometimes God doesn't give you an explanation at all and then there are other times he only gives an explanation by an experience and you're like, God, why'd you do that? He said, keep walking. And when you keep walking, you're going to run into the reason that I sent you that way. You're going to run into the reason that I took you through that. You're going to run into the reason that I made that decision. If you're following me, say yes. yes. So he runs into this Ethiopian eunuch. And the eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah. And the Bible says he doesn't understand what he's reading. So Philip is close enough to see him but not close enough to know what's going on. And so the text says, the spirit says, go to the chariot and stay there. So Philip walks up to the chariot and he say, what's going on? The man say, I'm confused. <laughs> he says, he says what you do? He said, I'm reading Isaiah. He says, do you understand it? Nope. How can I understand it unless someone explain it to me? And Philip explains Isaiah to this Ethiopian eunuch shows him Christ in what he's reading. The eunuch receives Jesus as Savior, gets baptized, and then proceeds to go back to Ethiopia. Let me tell you why I feel like shouting right now. I feel like shouting right now because I know something. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know it, maybe you don't. But I know something about the historical implications of what happened here in Acts chapter number eight. The, the text says he gets converted, he gets baptized, and goes back to Ethiopia. 
And there is a church in Ethiopia that credits its existence to the conversion experience of this man here in Acts chapter 8. It is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So the Ethiopian Orthodox Church links the spread of Christianity in Ethiopia to this incident in Acts chapter 8. Y'all are missing this. Y'all are missing this. Why is this important? This debunks and it dismisses the false, fraudulent, uninformed ideology that Christianity was given as a slave religion. Because the text is showing us Christianity existed in Africa before it even existed in Europe. It's in the text. And the enemy wants to use that narrative to make us resistant to the only thing that can save us and keep us and to make us whole. So don't you allow anybody to tell you you are deceived, bamboozled, misinformed. The devil is a liar. Let God be true and every man be a liar. This religion is for everybody. God has taken all people and made a people. But this didn't happen, this way at least, if it were not for Philip following the Spirit's leading. Because we don't know the implications of our obedience. Sometimes the stakes are higher than we think. Philip had no idea that he was going to run into someone who would be the catalyst for the spread of the Christian movement in one sector, sector of the segment of the world. Did you hear what I just said? He wasn't even alive to see the fruit of his labor. Because he was able to be directed. How many know this is important? How many want God to use you like that? Lord, I'm you. Okay. Well, here it is. This story in Acts 8 reveals to us the three biblical ways that the Holy Spirit directly or indirectly chooses to lead his people. It's all in the text. Somebody say three ways. Come on, say it again. Say three ways. Okay. Here's the first way we see it is this. It's right in the text. The Bible says the eunuch is reading the Bible. <laughs> Are y'all following me here? Okay, so this is, listen to pastor, listen to him, because the first way the Holy Spirit leads you and I is through passages of scripture. This is the primary way. This is, uh, y'all follow me? This is the principal way. It means that if I don't get this right, then it impacts my ability to determine and to discern whether or not the other feelings I'm having or words I'm receiving are actually God. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? I, 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 I got to get this right because this is the filter that I got to put all my feelings through because just because I feel feel like God's lead me to do something. My feelings may be real, but that doesn't mean they're right. Come on here. Here's what the Bible says about feelings. It says the heart is deceitful. Your heart will feel strong about something that's wrong. Let me see if I can get some honest people today that will admit that our heart has felt strong about a person that was wrong for us. Where's, where's the honest? Maybe it's online. I just want to know where the honest section is. It's, is the honest section at the 1130? Is it going to be at the 115? I don't, I, that's honest enough to say you look back at your previous relational choices. And sometimes you look in the mirror and say, I don't even know what I was thinking. I was dealing with emotional temporary insanity because I don't even see what I saw in them. I don't see what I saw in that felt strong about something that's wrong. Yeah. 
here's why this is important. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12 says this. It says, the word of God is powerful and is quick. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. I want you to catch this now. Sh uh, penetrating to the dividing of the soul and the spirit. So it's the word that divides the soul and the spirit. It's the word that divides the soul and the spirit. It's the word that divides the soul and the spirit. And my soul is my mind, will, emotions, imaginations, affections. It's my feelings. So sometimes it's difficult to determine if what I'm feeling is actually the father. So what I need is the word to divide. So I got to put my feelings through the filter of the word. And if my feelings don't make it through the filter of the word, no matter how strong it is, it's wrong. Hi -ya -ya. And the Bible says, I don't walk by feelings. Hi -ya. I walk by faith. Is there anybody here honest enough to know that your feelings can steer you wrong? That your feelings can drive you to a dead end? That your feelings can get you in a situation that it takes your faith to get you out of? I believe this is God. Well, when you want something bad enough, it becomes difficult to differentiate whether or not this is the soul or the spirit. Are y'all following me? <laughs> so this is why this is why we use things like change tracks to teach you the spiritual discipline of study. This is why, am I making sense? Yeah, this is why we, we talk to you about daily devotion. This is why we talk to you about getting in the word for yourself. Because without a, a, a well that is filled with scripture, you don't have a filter for your feelings. You don't have anything to put a so-called prophetic word to the test with. You're just thinking, no, no, d does it line up with my spirit? But what if my spirit out of line? Let me, I don't know where to go. I don't know what's, I was about to go to that side. I was like, I don't know. I think I'm going to go over here to the corner over here. Who's going to talk back to me? It's, it's, no, no, that doesn't line up with my spirit. That doesn't mean it's wrong. You might be wrong. Because a word might be telling you to correct something you don't want to correct. Or fix something you don't want to fix. Or see something you don't want to see. Agreement isn't a criteria for authenticity. Some stuff you need to hear you don't want to hear and don't want to agree with. Sometimes I need to say you're stubborn and you don't listen and you need to be more empathetic. You don't want to hear that, but it might be God. Lord, how shall I handle my enemy? He's going to lead me through a passage. Am I making sense here? So if I'm unwilling to do what is written visibly, I'm not, I'm not in position to demand that he speak verbally. Lord, give me a word. He said, I, I did. <laughs> Lord, open my ears. He said, open your Bible. I need, I need the 1130 to talk back better than me. Oh, open your Bible. I don't have time. Here it is. We got to wrap up. Here it is, family. Here it is. Listen to pastor. Please listen to me here. There, 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 there's something that I need you to understand. Is this. It's not just ingesting the word. It's interpreting the word properly. Listen, listen to pastor here in Luke chapter number 20, Luke chapter number 10, verse 25. This is what it says. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And here's what Jesus said. What is written in the law, which is what does the Bible say? And then he says, how do you read it? Because what you come away with is not just going to be based on what it says. What you come away with is going to be based on how you're reading it. So here's what I say. I trust the Bible. What I don't trust is people's interpretation of it. Come on. 
So here is where we need the Holy Spirit's help. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul tells Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles or rightly divides the word of truth. I'm done, Tario. Here it is. Everybody listen to me. This is where I need the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me interpret this right. Do you know how misinterpretation has been used? Does that make sense? Has been used to hurt and to harm and to hinder people? How people have used the misinterpretation of scripture to justify all sorts of social craziness? Pastor, what are one of the ways that I can do this? I'm done. Lord, I need, I need three sermons just on this. Here it is. Here it is. We all in the English language, we're familiar with word of God. There, there are a few Greek words. And Pastor, why are you saying Greek words? The New Testament was written in Greek. Does that make sense? Old Testament is written in Hebrew, some of it in Aramaic. So I, 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 I'm trying to see. Oh, this is 11:30, so I can just say it. Okay, here it is. When we first planted this church, the name of the church is called Kingdom Church because there are three ways you can do anything: culture's way, church's way, king's way. So when we say kingdom, we mean the the Creator's original intent. So we say Kingdom Church is like I want, we want to do church the king's way, right? Makes sense? Kingdom marriage. Marriage done the king's way. All right. So I listed out when we first started the church, something called 12 traits of a kingdom church. Look throughout scripture, say, what are some traits of church done God's way? And so one of them was based on Acts 17, 11, I think. It says, when the people heard, when the Bereans heard what Paul taught, they went home to study themselves to see if those things which he said are true. And so, so I would say it in a much more nice way now. I'd be way more tactful. But back then, I'm in my late 20s. I'm just gangster with it. So I just, so, so when I'm writing it down, this is what I wrote. Our church will not be dancing dummies. See, see y'all judging me. That was, come on. That, I'm in my late 20s. Y'all give me a break. I, 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 now I would say we will be spirit empowered and biblically informed. I would, I would say it differently now. I said, but, but I said, we will not be a church that has zeal with no knowledge. Woo, we had church today. What did he talk about? I don't know, child, but I don't know, but it was good. Here it is, family. Y'all follow me? So, so the Old Testament, New Testament, the Greek, and so when I was doing doctoral work, one of the prerequisites for entry into the program is that you had to learn one of those languages, and I chose Greek, and here's what I discovered, that... There's a word in John 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. That's a word called logos. And it refers to the mind, the, the, the reasoning, the rationale, the wisdom of God. So he's saying the mind, the reason, the rationale, and the wisdom of God is seen in Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh. So if I want to know what God meant by a thing, I need to look at Jesus. Y'all missing this. If you don't get this, you're never going to interpret the Bible right. And I, and I remember now, if I'm not challenging you to take a new look at something you already know, I'm not doing my job. So here's where a lot of misinterpretation of the Bible come from. People are reading the, the graphe, which is the written scripture, without trying to interpret it through the lens of the logos, which is Jesus. So they'll look at what the Bible says to do, and then they'll leave and try to figure out how to do that on their own. As opposed to looking at what the Bible says to do, then looking at Jesus and saying, okay, that's the way you're supposed to do it. And that's where some of us got holiness messed up. That's where some of us have holiness messed up because we read scriptures like be ye holy for I am holy. And then we leave and we start putting all these rules and regulations in place. It's dogma and we call it doctrine instead of looking at Jesus and saying that is holiness right there. And he had a life. Let me go to this side over here too. He didn't have a sinful life, but he had a life, which means I can have a life and not be sinning. He went to weddings. He went to dinner parties at people's houses. Y'all are not talking to me. 
Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Zachariah, I'm coming to your house tonight. Zacchaeus, I'm coming tonight. Mary Martha, give me some fish. I'm coming. That was holiness. So we're misinterpreting the Bible when you're reading what the Bible say and what it tells you to do without looking at what Jesus did. Because that's how you're supposed to do it. And so my question is, does your holiness resemble Jesus or the Pharisees? <laughs> Let's go, Tario. He leads through passages. Number two, he leads, God leads through people. And I know there's a lot of talk about prophetic words, and I'm going to do a transformation lab on that, on what the New Testament has to say about prophetic ministry, because a lot of that, I think it's kind of weird, because people feel called to prophetic ministry, but your temperament and your framework is all Old Testament. You sound like Isaiah. Let me go to this side over here. Yeah, yeah, it's like, so wait a minute. So how there is no change of expression in pro of prophetic ministry in the New Testament versus the Old? So people's whole framework for it is Old Covenant. Time out. There's nothing different post-Jesus than pre-Jesus. So I'm not talking about prophetic words here. I'm talking about primarily prophetic preaching. And preaching and teaching becomes prophetic when God takes a timeless truth from Scripture and delivers it to you in a timely way. That is, that is not just what you need to hear. You get it when you need to hear it. It's like you're sitting in church and you're like, God, I needed this today. So sometimes God will give you your answer through the sermon. This is why it's important to know who your pastor is. Now, I'm not saying God, your pastor is your only voice. He shouldn't be, but he's going to be the dominant voice God uses. He uses passages. He uses people. And number three, I'm done. He uses promptings. What's a spiritual prompting? It's, it's, a, it's a divinely inspired, biblically based nudge, intuit, in, intuitive hunches, inner impressions, inaudible messages that guide believers toward thoughts, actions, or decisions that can be aligned with the will of God. It's, it's not something I hear with these ears, it's something in here. Sometimes it's, it's a hunch. And here's, here's one of the ways God works with me. I'm not saying it's with you. I'm not saying this is doctrine. This is me. He works with me with peace. There's a decision I had to make recently. And I was stressing because I felt like I was guessing. You ever been there? Lord, I want to do what's right, but I don't know what you want me to do. So here's what happened. Every time I thought about doing it, I didn't get peace on it. And because he's the prince of peace. Where he is, there's going to be peace. So what did I do? I made a decision to walk away from what didn't give me peace. I got my answer because I didn't have peace about it. And today my prayer for us is that God opens our spiritual ears. Because the most consequential decisions in your life deserve divine consultation we should be teaching our children what do you think you feeling in your gut about school because my protection is on the other end of his direction well pastor I've gone away from his direction he still protected me me too but please don't call grace a blessing. That was great. That was mercy. I pray that God open our ears and give us spiritual sensitivity to be led through passages, people, and promptings.